Michael Chong. Remember that name? A former conservative cabinet minister who quit his portfolio over a matter of personal principle in 2006. Admired by colleagues on all sides, he rocketed back to political stardom by introducing his own bill to, among other things, give MPs more power and the prime minister's office less. Um, it won Commons approval by an overwhelming margin. Even the PM voted for it. But guess what? It's now stuck in the Senate and if the senators don't approve it, soon the bill will die. Bruce is in Ottawa tonight, Chantel is in Montreal, and Andrew is here in Toronto. Let me read you the first line of Jennifer Ditchburn's story on uh, Michael Chong's uh, Reform Act. Prospects are looking grim for Michael Chong's legislative baby, the Reform Act 2014. What happened here, Andrew? We don't know exactly. All I would say is nothing happens in the Senate, uh, at least on the Conservative side, without the PMO say so. We saw that from the emails from Mike Duffy affair. Uh, it's heavily whipped. It does appear that they're taking their own sweet time about it. The bill was into the Senate in early March. It was another six weeks before the first speech was raised, made, made against it. They've only had, I think, two speeches. Uh, it does look like there's somebody's uh, decided that this bill should should be delayed or there, there's some suggestion there might be amended next week, which would have the same effect of basically killing it. Uh, it's a dirty business. This was passed, as you say, by the House of Commons, 260 to 17. Enormous amounts of compromise went into that. Uh, it was watered down enormously from what it, it began with. To kill it in the Senate is a pretty sad business. Yeah, if they talk amendments, it means it would have to go back to the House of Commons. That's right. It would never get through there before the session ends in June. Uh, Chantel, where are you on this? Um, uh, pretty much where Andrew is in the sense that uh, if you were going to support it and your uh, party leaders, and party leaders didn't like that bill, but it was one rare, uh, almost symbolic victory for, for backbench MPs uh, on all sides of the House uh, to expect it to die in the Senate after it, it got this high profile, this overwhelming vote. Uh, was poor calculation, and if you are a senator uh, on the side of the government or on that other side, you have to think that it's already uh, possibly dangerous for you to be walking in dark corners of Parliament Hill these days because some of those MPs are going to pay the bills for whatever happened in the Senate over the past mandate to block the will of the House of Commons on a bill that is about how MPs will govern themselves. Uh, it kind of symbolizes everything that senators should not want about the upper house. Bruce? Well, it's a good bill and it should pass. And uh, I guess I think what's going on in the Senate right now is a mixture of things. It's a mess of chaos and tension and anxiety about the Auditor General situation. Um, I do think that there's, uh, there's only potentially discipline on the conservative side. And it is quite telling that even though the conservatives in the House um, decided to support this bill, the Prime Minister hasn't used much of the bully pulpit to uh, encourage senators to get on with the business of passing it. The fact that MP James Rajat uh, felt obliged to go public and say, look, this really should happen, people, and you should get in touch with your senators and tell them that they should get on with moving this bill is an indication of the fact that within Conservative ranks, uh, there are those who think that the Prime Minister is not four square behind this and deserves some of the blame if, in fact, this bill doesn't pass. Andrew, it's well known that you've been passionate about this bill. You've written about it often. Why should Canadians care? What difference does this bill make to them? Well, it's, it is greatly watered down, but the original intent of it was certainly to try, to try to redress the imbalance between the caucus leaders, not just the prime minister, but the caucus leaders, party leaders, and the caucus. Right now, the leader has basically the power of life or death over their careers. He has to have his, they have to have his signature on their nomination papers or they can't run. And meanwhile, of course, once the leader has been elected by whatever process the parties have devised that generally excludes the actual members of caucus, once he's in that job, he's, he can thumb his nose at them. Uh, so we, we have a real imbalance between the leader and the lead in, the, in our parliamentary system. But look, even if you thought the bill was terrible, senators, these people, just because you gave a lot of money to the Conservative or the Liberal Party 20 years ago, or you did some dirty work for the Prime Minister in some election, does not give you the democratic legitimacy to be passing judgment on a bill that was passed by the House of Commons. They have no more legitimacy to be defeating this bill than my barber does. Well, they, they, they do have the constitutional legitimacy to amend bills if they so decide. But the case of this bill is a bit different from most bills in the sense that it is a bill that conducts uh, MPs in the House of Commons that was voted by MPs. This is not something that you and me are going to be living through. Uh, it's harshest provision, if you can call it that, and only if the caucus agrees to be 
bound by the bill would be that a caucus could ultimately uh, obtain a leadership review. Well, we've all covered similar situations. They were simply more messy because there were no rules. But once you lose confidence of your caucus to the degree of open revolt, and remember, it only takes a few backbenchers, as Joe Clark would tell you, uh, you are done in any event. You know, let me show you what Michael Chong said about this about two weeks ago, um, because it's interesting. He compares the problems his bill is having uh, to another bill that, that makes a lot of headlines. Watch this. The Bill C-51, the government's anti-terrorism bill, just passed the House of Commons last week, Wednesday, and I have no doubt that this bill, which is quite uh, detailed and quite lengthy, will be through the Senate in a mere matter of weeks. There's no reason why the Senate can't pass the Reform Act, which is some six, seven pages long, before the end of June. Now, that, that is telling. I mean, to be fair, the uh, C-51 has yet to pass through the Senate, but it is expected to, but a much bigger uh, heavier bill than, than, uh, than, than the Reform Act. Uh, Bruce, the comparison of those two that he's making? Oh, I think it's a very telling comparison. I think that it's incumbent upon senators on the conservative side in particular. Um, some of the liberal senators have said, well, they don't like this aspect or that aspect, but they don't have the numbers to, uh, to keep this bill from passing. If the conservative senators don't want to get on with the business of this, some of them should step up to a microphone and explain why it is that they think on this bill of all bills, because Andrew and Chantel are absolutely right, that it touches on the role of the House of Commons and the way that the House of Commons is structured. Of all the bills for the Senate to decide and conservative senators to decide that this deserves even more sober second thought and a refusal to pass a piece of legislation that's had such broad support in the House of Commons, really quite an unusual situation. They should be called to account. All right. I want to switch to uh, the story that we watched Catherine Cullen do on the, on the news, and that's this question about the Canada Pension Plan and, 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 and what's going to happen to it or what could happen to it or what discussions could take place about it and the apparent flip-flop, uh, certainly by the, the uh, Conservatives, on this issue. Let me just show you uh, some of the politics behind this. is an important issue, a public policy issue, that a lot of Canadians are very concerned about in terms of pensions. Uh, but what we've witnessed in the last 24 hours on this is what you're going to witness a lot when the campaign really gets going on a daily basis on whatever the issue is, uh, score yourself a point for each political point you hear made in these three clips taken in the last 24 hours. Prime Minister Harper has a low tax plan for retirement savings. Through the tax-free savings accounts, registered disability savings plans, and now a voluntary option for the Canada Pension Plan. Canadians would have the ability to voluntarily choose how much they save. There's never been any openness, uh, although I have to say that in my private discussions with uh, Jim Flaherty, he seemed to be certainly more open uh, than the Prime Minister ever was. Um, as Nathan Cullen just called it, it's a bit of a deathbed conversion for the Conservatives, but it's similar to what we went through when they discovered the importance of reducing greenhouse gases. The fact that Mr. Harper is uh, suddenly talking about something that he did nothing but criticize and attack uh, for nine of the ten years he's been around, uh, and actually even before he got elected Prime Minister, uh, really is, seems tremendously insincere uh, and is nothing but electoral posturing. Chantel, you start us off. What's going on here? Huh. Uh, what is not going on is a serious intention on the part of this government to address pension reform, because if that were the case, one would suspect that uh, there would have been a hint of it in the budget. It wasn't that long ago, the budget. Uh, two, this is a government that is going into an election. Parliament will stop sitting soon, so those consultations are really like... A campaigning politician coming to you saying, I was the Minister of Finance and I have this campaign promise I'm consulting you on until the Conservatives are re-elected. That is all it is. What is more astounding is that uh, Joe Oliver is literally saying he's going to consult on something that Jim Flaherty and others said was unanimously rejected by his government and the provinces five years ago because it wouldn't work and it wasn't great. Uh, so, uh, and why the reversal? I think two things. Today, the only information that uh, the minister who was sent to talk about this had was uh, to this, what the Liberals are proposing. Uh, and two, I suspect that the Conservatives feel a bit vulnerable on their budget uh, and the doubling of the, of the TSFA and their 
trying to say that they are addressing pensions and pension reform for everyone. Andrew? Well, if I were naive, I would say there's an actual policy deb de de debate here <laughs> as to whether or not there's in fact a need to be bringing in a broad brush approach where you basically force everybody to save more whether they want to or not. Remember, people tend to think of this as being the government's going to give people something. They're going to give them more in their pensions. No, this is a forced savings plan that is being proposed in the opposition benches. There's been a flip-flop on both sides, of course. The government used to be against uh, voluntary plans. Now they're for them. The liberals used to be in favor of a voluntary plan. Now they're in favor of making it mandatory. I suspect part of this is obviously what Chantal is saying. I suspect also it's making the federal liberals line up alongside the provincial liberals uh, who are bringing in or promising to bring in a plan of this kind with a mandatory increase in the, in the, in the levy and hoping that this will prove unpopular amongst some voters in, in Ontario. Bruce? Well, it certainly feels like an improvisation. And alongside the the kind of the uh, allowance on the part of the government that they might consider at some point cutting the GST further, these coming just weeks really after the budget that was meant to be their um, their kind of template for entering the next election, uh, suggests that the Conservatives have seen something in the public opinion environment that makes them feel unsettled. It makes them feel as though as incumbents, maybe they were taking a little bit too much support for granted and that other ideas could come into the mix and draw the attention of voters so that they need to be a little bit more nimble and agile. It is going to be hard for them to talk about it much, and I suspect that's why, in part, they're saying, well, what we're really going to do is consult, because it's true that what they were saying only a little while ago is that this is a bad solution to a problem that didn't exist, and now they're saying, well, it might be a solution that we could look at, in part, for a problem that might or might not exist. One of the things that I think the government may have misread, and I don't know uh, enough about the economics of this to know what's right or what's wrong, but to, if you look at some of the numbers and say, well, people are mostly saving enough to retire, the public opinion on that suggests that as people imagine that they're going to live longer and imagine that interest rates are going to remain very low, there is more anxiety based on those kinds of factors that seem new in the environment today and may be causing a different political dynamic. Uh, there's more discussion about the issue there just in the last two minutes than we saw in all those clips. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because I, you know, I, I've heard increasing number of people talking in the last few weeks about the, the downside of fixed election dates, that you get into this prolonged period of, of campaigning like we're witnessing now and like the kind of discussions that we see taking place around this, but you, you could find the same kind of situation on other uh, issues in the last few weeks. Are, are we seeing the downside of fixed election dates here, Andrew? I, I beg to differ. I think we're seeing the upside. I mean, it's never going to be the most enlightening debate whether you have a short election or this month-long election. But I'd rather have a longer debate where you, these debates, th these points can go back and forth a bit and people can chew on them. But are we having a real debate? Well, we're having the closest thing we're going to get, Peter. I mean, we're not, we're not empirically in Athens here, but we are, what we are doing, we had that, a long discussion about the NDP daycare plan. We've had a discussion about the liberal tax plan. We've had a discussion about the budget. Imagine if all these things had been released within the space of two or three days in the midst of the hurly-burly of an election campaign. There'd be no attention paid to it at all. So there would be, there's no great alternative out there where we all discuss this in the most high-flowing terms. I'd rather have longer than shorter. All right, that's a good point. Chantel? Uh, I agree with Andrew. Uh, this proposal, as the others that he mentioned, will get, will get debated, talked about, demolished possibly, but more for the right reason than because someone uh, messed up on the day of the announcement. So up to a point, uh, with a timeline to an election, it suddenly matters what the government is saying because you're going to have a choice not to keep the government if you don't like what they're saying. So, so the, the, these four or five months are turning out, I think, to be uh, really useful policy-wise, and they're forcing every, everyone, I think, to up their policy game. 30 seconds, Bruce. Well, I think we see some upsides. I agree that there, we're having a conversation now about an issue that probably deserves to have some airing. If there are downsides to fixed elections, it's because we haven't figured out how to deal with things like government advertising encroaching on what is effectively an election period. And we don't have a system for deciding how we're going to have leaders debate uh, debates. Until we figure those things out in the context of fixed elections, it's going to be a mixed bag for sure. No, it's interesting. Uh, Chantel was mentioning last week, I think, that the, for all the millions Millions of dollars that have been spent on government advertising surrounding the budget, they haven't seemed to have had any bump as a result of it. Uh, in fact, I would argue that they, the bump that they had going into the year and to the budget has disappeared. 
yeah. and they're back at 30%, 30, 30 something. So, um, okay. not, not possibly why we're talking about pensions tonight. Yeah. All right, good discussion. Thank you, Andrew here in Toronto, Chantel, Montreal, Bruce in Ottawa.